All right. Leviticus chapter 4. Leviticus chapter 4. Our goal tonight will be to complete the major offerings and how they generally work. We'll get into next week the, some specific rules for specific situations for each of the offerings. We'll do that, God willing, next Sunday night. And then after that, we'll have the uh, Thanksgiving of praise. So looking forward to that. It's always a wonderful time. So uh, very excited about um, that coming up. So Leviticus chapter 4. Remember the very Hebrew title for the book is, and the Lord called. And so the meaning of the book of Leviticus is that we are called to be holy, called to be his people, called to be set apart, called to be different. We talked about the importance of that a little bit this morning, but we've been looking at this all throughout these offerings so far in the book of, beginning of the book of Leviticus. Remember Leviticus, it's a continuation of Exodus. So, you know, it, it picks up where Exodus finishes off and yet its focus is different. You know, while Exodus focused on God's promises to this new nation of Israel, Leviticus focuses on what kind of relationship they're to have. And because God is unique and pure, his people were to live that way too. And Israel would demonstrate that holiness, that different life and how they approach their God. It wouldn't be like the pagans with their various types of offerings and all and their various rituals and celebrations. God would do it differently. And so they would be set apart and they would bring up fascinating conversations. Oh, you got Israelites, you're having your feast to the Lord. What, what, what are you doing? Are you doing it like we do, you know, doing it like this, you know? And, and no, we don't do that. We don't do that at any of our feasts, really. What do you do? And then they would explain it. Why do you do that? Well, let, let me tell you, because everything had meaning. Everything had purpose. And so in the book of Leviticus, as God is showing them how they're going to be different, he starts off by explaining the various offerings that they could bring. We see that there's five major offerings. Three were voluntary. You didn't have to bring them. It was your choice. And two were required. We've looked at the voluntary ones, the burnt offering symbolizing your full surrender to God, the meal or meat or grain offering uh, that, that was symbolizing your surrender to God, I mean, uh, your service to God. Then the peace offering, which was really just to hang out with God. It meant a, a fellowship or a, you know, a, a, a relationship offering. And now tonight we're going to look at the, the final two, which was the required offerings, which was the sin and the trespass offering. Now, one of the reasons Leviticus is so important is because it builds a foundation for us to understand very important truths. One of the truths that has come under attack, uh, not necessarily recently, it's been recast recently, is the idea of substitutionary atonement. The idea that Jesus paid our penalty on the cross, that he died for our sins on the cross. Frequently you hear people say, that's a horrible thing that God would punish someone for our sins, you know. And so they, they say, they kind of focus on Jesus' sacrifice, you know, in the sense of his example. That, you know, he laid down his life for us. Which, frankly, I think that's the dumbest decision ever that anyone made to say, how can I prove, you know, what sacrifice looks like? I know, I'll die, you know. That's fine if you're dying dying for something, but if you're just doing it to show what sacrifice is, we call that a waste. You know, if, if you know, if someone dies for something, but, but other people die in the process, we don't usually talk about it as a sacrifice. You think, oh, it wasn't for anything. On the other hand, when someone dies and other people get to live, then guess what? We call it an awesome, marvelous sacrifice. Jesus did not waste his life on the cross. He paid the penalty for our sin. And so it's important. The reason you know, we get people, now sometimes you hear that and you go, oh, that makes sense. We should sacrifice for one another. And Jesus was our example. But if you, you don't understand Leviticus, you might think that. But if you come to Leviticus, there's no way you would ever think that. Because when we get to the sin offering and the trespass offering, we see very clearly that this is for our actions and that something else is paying the price for it that we might be forgiven all pointing forward to Christ's ultimate sacrifice on the cross, that our sins be wiped away forever. So, chapter 4, Leviticus, we'll start with a sin offering, verse 1. And the Lord spoke unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, If a soul shall sin through ignorance against any of the commandments of the Lord, concerning things which ought not to be done, and shall do so against any of them, 
And then what's going to happen is you can say, if he's a priest, this is what he has to do. If he's a ruler, this is what he has to do. If he's the common person, this is what he has to do. And if it's the whole congregation that did it, this is what they have to do. So verses one and two are kind of just a general statement on sin offerings. And it describes for us what the sin offering is. It mentions here, if a soul shall sin through what? Ignorance. The idea here is if, if you know, um, we used to play this game, and I can't remember what it was, with a dartboard. And, you know, normally when you figure with a dartboard, you want to hit the bullseye, right? But we played a game where you, it, you weren't aiming for the bullseye. You were actually aiming for certain numbers. I don't remember what it was, and, it, and if it's like a, like a gambling game or something like that, then just erase this on the tape. But, you know, the idea was is you'd have to hit a nine or you'd have to, you know, you'd have to hit something specifically. And so you would be aiming for that specific, you know, number. And if you missed it, you missed the mark. That's what the word here for sin means. It means to miss the mark. And then it mentions through ignorance. So like, you know, God has a standard. And, you know, if, if you were to wake up and say, Lord, I want to serve you today. I want to be a, a good Israelite. I want to I honor you with all I do. And you're aiming for a mark. You're aiming for a specific spot. And, and it says yet through ignorance, which means to inadvertently sin or to unintentionally sin, to make an error. And that happens, you know. There are times when we say things and we get completely misunderstood. You hurt somebody's feelings. You're like, oh man, I, that was totally not what I meant at all. You know, and yet you still did hurt someone, right? You still did incur wrongdoing. Something wrong happened, even though there was no intent to harm or intent to do something wrong. The Lord says, well, if that happens, then here's what you have to do. And the first group he starts off with, if they sin unintentionally, he says, it's the priest. And so in verse three, he says, if the priest that is anointed, so these are unintentional sins. These are not sins that you knew what you were doing was wrong and you did it anyway. You know, I'm mad at you and I know they really get upset when I say this, but I'm saying it anyway. That's not what this is talking about. This is when you blow it and you weren't intending, you were trying to do the right thing, but you messed up, you know, you fell short, you missed what you were aiming for. He says, if the priest does that, it says here, the priest that is anointed do sin according to the sin of the people. And let him bring for his sin, which he has sinned, a young bullock without blemish. You know, how many times does God remind us it's sin? I mean, four times there you see the word where he's saying, no, it's still sin. Even though you didn't mean it, it's still wrong. And if that happens, he shall bring a young bullock without blemish unto the Lord for a sin offering. Now that's interesting because that's the upper tier of sacrifices. That was an expensive sacrifice. And the idea here is that when a leader like this sins, it's a big deal. You know, and, and it is, unfortunately, I, you know, <laughs> you know, sometimes when these politicians get up there and, and you, some of these things come out about them and you're like, man, I, I'm glad I don't have that type of a spotlight, you know, on me, you know, that somebody's digging for information on that person to find something wrong with them, you know, and, uh, yet, you know, the Lord sees everything that we do. He knows it. So we should always be trying to live for him. But the reason why a leader has to be really careful, you know, particularly in this case, a spiritual leader, he has to be really careful is because you can stumble a lot of folks because they're looking to you as an example. And so when he blew it, he had to bring an ox. He had to bring a, a bullock, I mean, and it says without blemish unto the Lord uh, for a sin offering. So he had to select the perfect animal for a sin offering, no blemish. It had to be a bullock. And then he shall bring the bullock now unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation before the Lord. And he shall lay his hand upon the bullock's head and kill the bullock before the Lord or in the Lord's presence. He would not do the killing, the priest would, um, because it mentions here now the priest that is anointed shall take the blood and, and do all this stuff. So what's interesting here is when you blew it like that, you couldn't just fix it at home. You couldn't just go out and say, okay, Lord, I blew it. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go get my favorite bull and, and we're going to, you know, sacrifice him to you and, and do it right here. No, you had to take that bull and you had to make the long walk wherever it was in Israel at the time to the tabernacle. And, and bring it, and, and you're a priest. I mean, you know, you're a priest walking up with a bullock. Everybody's thinking, what did he do, you know? I mean, you know, that's a priest, man. He's supposed to be the example. What did he do? But that, that bullock that you're bringing up there, you know, whereas the common person would bring a lamb or a goat, it'd be a reminder of the seriousness, uh, to be an example, to watch your tongue, to not, you know, make these types, you know, be on your guard to not make these kinds of mistakes. So he would bring him all the way to the door of the tabernacle. Had to do it God's way, not his. Had to do it at God's house, not his house. 
And when he gets there, it says, he shall lay his hand upon the bullock's head and kill the bullock before the Lord. You know, the time there of identifying with the offering. You know, we talked about this is something that happens with every offering, the sense of you're going to take my place because I'm a sinner. The difference is in this particular instance, he would have to come and confess the specific sin that brought him there. So he would come and he would lay his hand on that animal and he would say, I am here today because of this that I did, Lord. You tell us not to do this and I didn't mean to do it, Lord, but I did do it. I did do it and I fell short and I'm so sorry. Will you please forgive me? I'm asking you to accept this offering on my behalf. I know what I deserve, Lord, for my actions. Will you take this instead? And then they would kill the animal and butcher the, you know, the animal we'll see in a moment and, and offer some to the Lord and then, you know, do something else with what remained. So the offer's job had to be to select that perfect animal, bring it to the tabernacle, confess your sin, and then kill the offering. And as that's done now, verse 5, the priest's job, he would, he, the priest that is anointed shall take of the bullock's blood and shall bring it to the tabernacle of the congregation. And the priest shall dip his finger in the blood and he will sprinkle of the blood seven times before the Lord, before the veil of the sanctuary. And then the priest shall put some of the blood upon the horns of the altar of sweet incense before the Lord. And when it says before the Lord, it means in the Lord's presence. So he's going into the tabernacle to do this. I'll explain that in a second. And he shall pour all the blood of the bullock at the bottom of the altar of the burnt offering, which is at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. So the priest then would catch the blood just like the other blood offerings, the other animal sacrifices, and he would bring it into the tabernacle. But it mentions here something we haven't seen before. He would dip his fingers in the blood and then he would sprinkle it seven times before the Lord. And he mentions specifically where? Before the veil, uh, the veil of the sanctuary. And remember... You have to go back a little bit to the tabernacle. The tabernacle is a big tent, okay? Big, huge, rectangular tent. You come inside the door on the east side. And as you come in, there's a large uh, brass altar there where they would burn the meat. And then there'd be this little covered tent here. And in between the altar and the tent, you'd have this big tub where the priests would do their washings, you know, because butchering is not exactly clean work. Once you would go through the curtain into the, the covered tent, you'd be in what's called the holy place. In front of you, if you're facing here, on the right, you would have the uh, table of showbread. On the left, you'd have the golden uh, uh, menorah. And then right in front of you, there'd be another veil, another curtain. But in front, right against the curtain, would be a, a golden altar of incense. Of course, inside the veil would be the what? Holy of holies, right? With the Ark of the Covenant. Priest did not go in there. So he would take this blood from the animal and he would sprinkle seven times the veil that was there. And then he would put some of that blood upon the horns of the altar of sweet incense, that golden altar that's inside the holy place. Now, normally no blood sacrifice would be placed there. In fact, the only time we're going to see this is with the priest. The reason it's done with the priest is because he can't minister there unless it's taken care of. You know, he's the one who's serving the people. He has to go in there and he has to have the Lord. You know, he's going to have to, he's the one praying for the people. He's the one serving the people. All of that has to be cleansed and sanctified anew and afresh, you know. You know, when a leader, a spiritual leader sins, it affects the people of God. And the Lord says, you need to fix this whole mess so that, you know, you can be a good example once again. This was a big deal for him. Very different than what would happen if someone else sinned. And so there's more instructions. Now, when he was done with that, the, the spritzing, and then the, he put it on the horns of the altar, they were just these like golden tips that were on the, where the incense would burn. He would, you know, touch there. Then he would go back outside into the open area where the burnt, uh, where the uh, altar of sacrifice was. And then he would pour all the blood at the bottom of the altar. That's where all the blood would always go. And the idea is it's being offered to the Lord there. In verse eight, now we see the God's portion. And he shall take off from it all of the fat of the bull for the sin offering, the fat that covers the inwards and all the fat that is upon the inwards, the guts and then the fatty substance that held the guts together, the two kidneys and then the fat that's upon them, which is by the flanks and the call above the liver with the kidneys, it shall he take away. 
as it was taken off from the bullock of the sacrifice of peace offerings, like last week we learned. And the priest shall burn them upon the altar of burnt offerings. So all the fat went to God. So in the sin offering, all the fat, just like the peace offering, would go on the altar. And the idea was it's burning there on the altar. And God, had, if, it, if it burned up, then God had accepted the sacrifice. Okay? So now we go down to verse 11. And here's where things get a little different with the meat and whatever's left of the animal. It says, and the skin of the bullock. It says, and all his flesh with his head, his legs, his inwards, his dung, even the whole bullock shall he carry forth without, outside the camp, unto a clean place where the ashes are poured out and burn him on wood, on the wood with fire where the ashes are poured out shall he be burned. So obviously you imagine each day they would at least have you know, a few offerings every day because you had the burnt offering in the morning uh, and the evening. So you'd have at least a couple animals barbecue in there every day and that would create ashes. They would take those ashes out to a clean place. I'll explain what that is in a moment, outside the camp. And that's where they would be. And they would, you know, that way they wouldn't just, you know, collect on the, under the altar every day. He says, when you take the fat off God's portion, he says, you take everything else and you bring it to the same place where you dispose of the ashes. And that's a lot of meat that could have been used to feed somebody that they would normally eat. And the Lord says, no, nobody's eating this. It's all gonna be taken outside the camp to a clean place. Now, realize inside the camp where Israel was, that was where all the people were. Now, if you became ceremonially unclean for some reason, you had to go outside the camp because, you know, if you became, you know, a leper or something like that, so you wouldn't infect anybody, you would have to go outside the camp. You know, if you became ill in a way that was contagious, we'll get to more of that in Leviticus, you had to go outside the camp. And the idea was you don't infect anybody. Spiritually, it would speak to the fact that, you know, when we talk about sin, you know, Sickness is evidence not of specific sin in our lives, but there's the fact that we live in a fallen world and none of that could be in God's presence. God is holy. The Bible says flesh and blood can't inherit the kingdom of God. Nothing that is imperfect, nothing that is even comes short in the slightest of way can approach unto him. So all of that had to be taken out to a designated area where there would be the unclean. But outside the camp, these ashes would be placed in a spot far away from them too. They would be deposited in a ceremonially clean area. And then all this stuff would be taken there and burned up completely. So we're talking not just well done, well gone, you know. It was just completely burned up so there'd be nothing left and no one else would eat anything. Now, when you think to yourself, wow, that's a, oh, that's a ton of food gone, that's that's. Wow, that's, I mean, an animal skin, I mean, it could have been used for clothing, everything, you know, stuff that would normally go to, you know, provide for the priest family. And the Lord says, no, all of it is burned up. And I think the reason the Lord did that is to show us the exceeding sinfulness of sin. And one of the things I hear people frequently say is, I just think God's a little harsh, or I don't really understand why God's so, you know, such a big deal. That, yeah, we sin, everybody sins, you know. God doesn't. God doesn't at all. And, and, and when we do any of the things, whether they're big or small, they're, they're a horrible thing to him. You remember when Adam and Eve sinned? It doesn't seem like a whole lot. They ate the apple, you know, I mean, or whatever fruit it was, you know, the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It doesn't seem like much. I mean, how many times do we do something like that every day? We know we're not supposed to do something. God tells us not to do it. We do it anyway. There's not a whole lot of fallout from it. We just kind of go on with our lives. And yet the Lord, what does he say to Adam and Eve when he comes looking for him? He said, when he finds him, he says, Adam, what have you done? I mean, there's a, a sense of, have you even comprehended what you've done? And so the Lord, every time this would happen, all of it would be burned. You know, when that priest was bringing it out, it'd be burning everything, it would just it'd be in front of him thinking, this could have fed a family, this could have, and yet realizing just how horrible and ugly and what a, a waste sin is. Totally opposite of what God designed and intended for us. And so it'd all be burned outside there. So that's what happens, that's what the priest had to do if he sinned. In verse 13, now if the whole congregation, so now this is a national sin, 
If the nation sin of Israel sinned through ignorance, and the thing be hid from the eyes of the assembly, and they have done somewhat against any of the commandments of the Lord concerning things which should not be done, and they're guilty, when the sin which they have sinned against it is known, then the congregation shall offer a young bullock for the sin and bring him before the tabernacle of the congregation. So again, the same thing. Maybe the nation's unaware of something they've done that's wrong, that's displeased the Lord. You know, and the, and the Lord you know, says, if this is going to be the case, you know, you, and, I, and he brings it to their attention. I don't know if he sends a prophet or somebody just says, you know, the word says this and we're doing this. If that's the case, the Lord says, well, to get right with me, this is what you have to do. So the nation, they would have to bring a young bullock and the nation would be represented in verse 15. It says, by the elders. And the elders of the congregation shall lay their hands upon the head of the bullock before the Lord and the bullock shall be killed before the Lord. So they would represent, the, the word elders there means those who are in authority. So these would be the rulers of each tribe. The, they would be you know, the people of responsibility and authority among the nation. So they would have to come and they would do the same thing as the priest. They'd have to get a perfect animal you know, they'd have to come to the tabernacle, couldn't do it in, you know, at city hall or something like that. They had to come God's way. They had to identify with the offering and, and in doing so saying, Lord, this, this thing is having to die because of our sin that we as a nation have gone away from you, you know? Frequently, I personally try to wrestle with, you know, what... You know, how do we pray, you know, for our nation? You know, how do we, I mean, I know scripturally there are certain things that are very clear. We pray that we can have a peaceable life, right? We pray for our leaders. The Bible tells us, commands us to do that. But, you know, as you see the culture deteriorate over time, you know, you, you wonder like, Lord, how should we pray specifically, you know? And, and, you know, the only thing I keep being drawn from, drawn to in the scriptures is, you know, when the Lord says, judgment starts in the house of God. Every time I think about, you know, Lord, you know, this is horrible, this is horrible, this is horrible. And the Lord just comes back to me and he goes, Lord, Will, how are you shining? Even to the nation of Israel, the Lord said to them, if my people were called by my name, the people of Israel, if they will humble themselves, if they will repent, if they'll turn back to me, then I'll forgive and heal their land. And while the nation of the United States is not Israel and that scripture can't directly apply to us, as Christians, I think the Lord would have us turn inward again and say, Lord, how can I you know, be more yielded to you? How can I be turning away from the things that displease you and be walking more closely to you? And really, I think that's, you know, as I ponder and I think, you know, what will, what will turn a nation that is, seems, for lack of a better term, hell-bent on going away from the Lord? How, how, do, we, how do we affect change? And, and what I keep seeing in the scriptures as I pour over this is it, it, it's through our lives, you know? It's, it's through our testimony, through the impact we have on the everyday people that, that we interact with as they see Jesus in us. And so more and more, I'm just praying, Lord, help me to shine. Help me to be different. And there, as the Lord points out, Lord, I, I choose to change. I, I repent. Lord, I, I cry out to you. I want to be a light and a testimony. You know, and for the, the nation here, you know, these leaders, they, they had to do that. They had to come and say, Lord, we're here because as a nation, we went away from you. But we're here saying, Lord, as examples for the nation. I'm gonna, we're gonna stand in the gap for the nation and say no more. Lord, we have, it's been brought to our attention what we have done wrong, and so now we turn back to you. And we do this as representatives of our nation, Lord, we stand in the gap. You know, I think that's one of our jobs. Uh, you know, the Bible tells us that we're ambassadors for Christ. You know, and I think we stand in the gap for a world that doesn't know him and you know, doesn't know any better, you know? So they would confess that whatever the sin was that the nation had done against the Lord. You know, and you think, well, that's, why should I be confessing things that my nation has done as if I'd done it? Daniel does that in Daniel chapter 9. With apologies to the men's ministry who are covering Daniel 9 this week. I've always been blown away by this, but Daniel chapter 9 Verses three and four, he'd been reading the scriptures and he knew that the time was coming soon that the scripture would be fulfilled, that they were gonna return back to Israel from Babylon. 
Daniel began to pray. And this is what he said in verses three and four. And I set my face unto the Lord God to seek by prayer and supplication with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. These three elements were signs of repentance. They were outward signs of inward repentance. And I prayed unto the Lord my God and I made my confession and said, O Lord, the great and awesome God, keeping the covenant and mercy to them that love him and to them that keep his commandments, we have sinned. And have committed iniquity. What's his we stuff? Daniel didn't do anything wrong, you know? But what's his confession to make? He, every time we see him, he's just a godly man. In fact, Ezekiel brings up, God speaking to Ezekiel says, you know, he brings Daniel up as an example of a godly man. He said, even if there were more Daniels and everything like that, I'd still wouldn't, you know, forgive the nation and, you know, and, and not bring them into Babylon. And yet here's Daniel confessing. We have committed iniquity. We have done wickedly. We have rebelled. You know, neither have we hearkened unto your servants. You know, O Lord, verse 7, righteousness belongs unto thee, but unto us. <laughs> you know, he identifies. I've just been pondering on that thought. You know, that's what the elders had to do here. They had to identify with the whole nation and say, Lord, we have blown it. Even if maybe they hadn't been the specific one to do so. They took responsibility for it. And they killed the animal before the Lord. In verse 16, back in Leviticus 4, the priest that is anointed. It's interesting, this is, I don't recall that phrase anointed being in the previous offerings, but it makes mention of it here. I think there'll be significance when we get to our application of how it points to Jesus. The priest that is anointed shall bring of the bullock's blood to the tabernacle of the congregation. And the priest shall dip his fingers in some of the blood and he shall sprinkle it seven times before the Lord, even before the veil. Again, this is national sin going on, requiring national repentance and national restoration of their relationship with God. So he went into the holy place and he did the same thing. And he shall put some of the blood upon the horns of the altar, which is in the presence of the Lord. That is in the tabernacle of the congregation. And then he'll come back out and pour out all the blood at the bottom of the altar, the burnt offering, which is at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And then verse 19, we see the God's portion again. He shall take all of his fat from him and burn it upon the altar. And he shall do with the bullock as he did with the bullock for a sin offering. So shall he do with this. So in other words, you'll take everything outside the camp. Again, everything that's not the fat, everything that's not God's part, you'll take it outside the camp and make an atonement for them and it shall be forgiven them. And he shall carry forth a bullock outside the camp and burn him as he burned the first bullock. It is a sin offering for the congregation. And so here we are introduced to this idea of atonement. The word here means a covering. He shall make a covering for them and it shall be forgiven. They will be pardoned for their sin. You know, the sprinkling of the blood seven times, you know, seven has always been the number of completion, right? There's seven, you know, days in a week. Is there seven notes on the scale? Is that correct? I don't know. Somebody's like, no, there's like nine. I don't know. How many there? I think that's right. You know, seven is, has always been a number that's been used for completion. And so seven times here, it would speak of complete restoration between God and man who had been separated by their sin, the complete restoration of God and the nation of Israel. And of course, the burning of the fat, again, it would signify restoration now of fellowship between God and Israel, that they would be okay again, that, that God would not have to judge them for their sin because they had made things right with him. They had confessed it. Next, verse 22, we see what would happen if a political leader had to uh, had sinned. Verse 22 says, when a ruler, and the word just there means a leader. So when a leader had sinned, and done somewhat through ignorance, so this would be a civil leader, against any of the commandments of the Lord his God concerning things which should not be done, and he's guilty, or if his sin wherein he has sinned come to his knowledge. So either if you do something, ah, oh, I'm not supposed to do that, ah, uh, I blew it. Or if you do something and don't realize it, then someone else brings it to your attention. He says, either way, you have to bring his offering a kid of the goats, a male without blemish. Interestingly, they don't have to bring the big bullock. So apparently God's opinion of spiritual leaders is a little bit higher than those of civil leaders. I don't know if that's true. Makes me feel better. 
and he shall lay his hand upon the head of the goat and kill it in the place where they kill the burnt offering before the Lord. It is a sin offering. So the same thing, the offerer would have to select a male goat without blemish, uh, you know, for the offering, bring it to the tabernacle, God's way, not his way. Identify with the offering, confess his sin. The offering would be killed. In verse 25, the priest, the same job. He shall take of the blood of the sin offering with his finger, but here he won't go inside because this is an individual. It's not, a, it's not considered a spiritual thing because he doesn't stand in the gap for the people in the way you know, that, that, uh, that, that uh, the priest would, um, which, which shows that, that you know, the requirements for a civil leader are not as high as that for a spiritual leader. You know, frequently I think Christians have been critiqued for saying, well, you just want somebody as perfect as a, as a civil leader. And, and I think that would be wrong for us to want that. First off, that person doesn't exist. They don't exist in this pulpit either, you know. But, you know, you, what you're looking for in the character of, of someone who's a civil leader is, is someone who is, you know, uh, just a, a good man, you know. Someone who is a, 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 a person of character. And you look all throughout the Old Testament, and you know, it says, find someone of good report. Somebody who doesn't take bribes. Somebody that can be counted on. Somebody that's not, a, you know, that doesn't, you know, not an idolater, not a blasphemer. You know, someone that's got general good character that can be an example to the people and make wise decisions. You know, and, and I think that, you know, allows us at times to, you know, we don't have to find the, you know, like, I, would you vote for a non-Christian? I think I'd be fine to do that if they're a person of character, you know. Anyway, I've gotten off track. Priest job. So unlike the, the priest sin or the national sin, he doesn't go into the holy place. He just takes it and he takes of the blood of the sin offering, verse 25, with his finger, and he puts it on the horns, not of the altar of incense, where prayer is symbolized, but the altar of burnt offering. And then he pours the rest of it at the bottom of the altar of burnt offering, and everything else is the same. He shall burn all of his fat upon the altar as the fat of the sacrifice of peat offerings, that, you know, popping gristle that we all love to eat. Whoa, are you asleep? That was supposed to be semi-gross, you know? Was, at least they didn't hear ha ha so I was hoping to hear Ugh, you know and the priest shall make an atonement for him as concerning his sin and it shall be forgiven him so the leader he would come forward and as that was barbecuing on the altar it would be an atonement for him and he would be forgiven verse 27 now again or in verse 26 he'd take all the the fat he does that but then it doesn't mention it here but definitely all the other stuff would be burned outside the camp as well now, verse 27, we get to the last group, and it says, and if any one of the common people sin, and here the word common people, it, it just simply means those who are, you know, the people of the land. It just means if anybody else comes, um, it mentions here, if they sin through ignorance, while he does somewhat against any of the commandments of the Lord, concerning things which ought not to be done, and he's guilty, or if his sin, which he has sinned, come to his knowledge. Well, then he has two options, actually. He can bring a kid of the goats, a female without blemish for his sin, which he has sinned. So the difference here between the ruler or the leader, civil leader, and the common person is one had to be male, one had to be female. Um, I don't understand fully the significance of that, except that the female would, would be used for different purposes that would be not considered as expensive. So um, that's the only reason that that would be something that the common person would bring and the leader had to bring something of greater value because his sin would be, ha, affect more people. So the same thing, they'll come. It says, you pick one without blemish, verse 29. He'll lay his hand upon the head of the sin offering and slay the sin offering in the place of the burnt offering. And the priest shall take of the blood thereof with his finger and put it upon the horns of the altar of the burnt offering and shall pour out all the blood thereof at the bottom of the altar. Take away all the fat. It says, as the fat is taken away from off the sacrifice of peace offerings, same as they do it there, and then the priest shall burn it upon the altar for a sweet savor unto the Lord. That sweet barbecue smell as it would be going up would be pleasing to the Lord as someone had come and they'd confess their sin. Lord, I, I shouldn't have done this. Lord, I know I wasn't trying to, Lord, but I did it anyway. And I shouldn't do that. And I don't want to do that anymore. So I ask that you forgive me. And when someone came with that humility, you know, before the Lord with confession of sin, the Lord said, I'm pleased by that. I do forgive you. I do pardon you, you know? For it says here, the priest shall make an atonement for him and it shall be forgiven him. You know, as they saw that meat go up on the altar and be consumed, it'd be the idea of their sin being wiped away, you know? No longer held against them. 
Now, if he bring a lamb for a sin offering, he shall bring it a female without blemish. And then it's the same exact thing. Verse 35 at the end, it says, and the priest shall make an atonement for his sin that he has com committed and it shall be forgiven him as well. So the same thing, just so you could bring a goat or a lamb, a female for your sin offering, okay? So a couple things that I think we should take notice of with all of these offerings. Notice no one is excluded, Right? doesn't matter what your socioeconomic status is, right? Whether you're a priest, whether you're a ruler, whether you're a common person, whether it's everybody, everybody is included in this. All fall short, right? There's provision made for every person because all fall short. So something important for us to remember when it regards our sin. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Secondly, notice that God holds man accountable for unintentional sin. He does. Well, I didn't mean it. You know, that's sometimes when you tell the kids and you discipline them for something, well, I didn't mean to do that. I'm sure you didn't. <laughs> but now you'll really not mean it next time. <laughs> you know, my kids will say sometimes, well, you know, but you know, I, I, I just forgot. And I say, you know, it's not just that you forgot. It means you also refuse to remember. It wasn't important enough for you to make it a part of your, remem you know, your remembrance for that day. You know, and, and God does hold us responsible, not just for the things we know we do, shouldn't do, and we do it, but he holds us responsible for the things that we just fail to do. That's how serious sin is. And then thirdly, notice the offerer ate no portion of the sacrifice. He did no work in the offering. He had no part in it. All the work was done by the priest, and the only one who got the portion was God. So, in light of that, how does this point to Jesus? Well, obviously, he's our sin offering, right? <laughs> I mean, I didn't have to probably point that out to any of you. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 18 and 19 describes him as the lamb without blemish. It says in 1 Peter 1, verses 18. Oops, wrong chapter. It says, For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver and gold, from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, your old way of living that was worthless. He says, but you've been redeemed with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without spot and without blemish. You know, he is our sin offering without blemish, the perfect sinless lamb of God, as John the Baptist said, who what? Takes away the sin of the world. And then the guilt of our sin for our sin was placed upon him. You know, people say, well, that's the Old Testament. Listen, the whole basis of the New Testament sacrifice is because they're all shadows for the substance, which is Jesus. And it makes it very clear here in 2 Corinthians 5.21. Why don't you turn there real quick? That way we can all read it together. 2 Corinthians 5.21. It says, for he, that's God, has made him, that's Jesus, to be sin for us. Who knew no sin? Jesus had never sinned. He's that lamb without blemish. He's that lamb without blotch. And yet God made him to be sin for us. Why? So that we could be made the righteousness of God in him. By our faith in him, his righteousness could be given to us. Our sin is given to him. You know, when we talk about the cross, it's no mere sacrifice and shows you how we should maybe give up watching a football game to spend time with the kids, which is true, but that's not what the cross means. Jesus became sin for us. He became the one who was punished for our sin that we might receive the righteousness of God in him. But not only is he our sin offering, he is also our priest. For he was anointed as our high priest by God. You could jot down this scripture to look it up later, but in Hebrews chapter one, when the writer is trying to explain how Jesus is better than the angels, he says in verse seven, and of the angels, he says, they are, he, he makes them his, his angel spirits and his ministers a flame of fire. 
But unto the Son, he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is a scepter of your kingdom. For you have loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Therefore, God, even your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness above your fellows. He is our high priest, the one that we come to with every need that we have. Because he has been anointed by God as such. Turn to Hebrews 9 with me. Hebrews chapter 9. Here we're going to see tons of things that the sin offering points to Jesus. It's going to show us that he did all the work required for us to be forgiven. That he presented his blood to the Lord in the holy of holies in heaven. And that he took our sin and sent it away. Just like the priest would take it outside the camp. So it would never be remembered against us again. Burned up everything. None of it was eaten to be consumed. To be remembered in some way. To be experienced in some way again. No. It was taken outside the camp and completely burned up. In the same way that Jesus took our sin and sent it away. Never to be remembered against us again. For it says in, Roman, in uh, Hebrews 9 verse 6. Now when these things were ordained. The tabernacle and all its furniture and all that stuff. The priests went also into the first tent, the holy place, and there they did the service of God, accomplishing the service of God. But in the second, the holy of holies, the high priest, he went alone once every year and not without blood, which he would offer for himself and for the errors of the people. That's the day of atonement. We'll get to that later on in Leviticus. But I want to focus on this word errors here. The word errors here means sins of ignorance. When Jesus, you know, they would, they would do this, it was not because the nation was just because they were evil. It's just because we fell short. They sinned, like we all do. Well, Jesus, he's the fulfillment of that. Let's go down to verse 24 of chapter 9. For Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are the figures, or the idea is it's a figurative, it's, it's a picture of the true tabernacle in heaven. But he went into heaven itself. Now to appear in the presence of God for us. Nor yet that he should offer himself often, like all the sin offerings that had to be brought, as a high priest entered into the holy place every year with the blood of others. For if that was the case, then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world. But now, once in the end of the world, has he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. The phrase there, put away, means to send away and never come back. He took our sin and he sent it away so it can never come back to us, never be held against us again. And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment, so Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many. And unto them that look for him without, uh, shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. He died for our sins and he took those sins with him outside the camp. Look at Hebrews 13 with me. Hebrews 13, verse 10. I'm going to have to hurry. The writer says, we have an altar whereof they have no right to eat who serve at the tabernacle. Those priests there who serve, they can't eat from our altar. For the bodies of those beasts, the ones we talked about in chapter 4, Leviticus whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin, those bodies, they're burned outside the camp. That's where our altar is. Wherefore, Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered without the gate. Where was Jesus crucified? Golgotha, right? The hill of the skull, outside the city. Let us go forth, therefore, unto him outside the camp, bearing his reproach. So... Jesus is our sin offering. And we fulfill that in our lives by following him out there. First off, by coming to the cross and confessing our sins and believing on him to be our sin offering. And the secondly, by living outside the camp, not in the legalism that existed in Jesus' day inside Jerusalem, but outside the camp, under grace and under the new covenant. Well, chapter five, the trespass offering. Now he says here, and if a soul sin, and hear the voice of swearing, and is a witness, whether he has seen it or known of it, if he do not utter it, then he shall bear his iniquity. Or if a soul touch any unclean thing, whether it be a carcass of an unclean beast, or a carcass of an unclean cattle, or the carcass of an unclean creeping things, dead roaches, 
And if it be hidden from him, he shall also be unclean and guilty. Or if he touch the uncleanness of man, whatsoever uncleanness it be, that a man shall be defiled withal. And it be hid from him, when he knows of it, then he shall be guilty. Or if a soul should swear, pronouncing with his lips to do evil or to do good, whether it be that a man shall pronounce with an oath, and it be hid from him, when he knows of it, then he shall be guilty in one of these. And it shall be, guilt be when he shall be guilty in one of these things that he shall confess that he has sinned in that thing. And he shall bring his trespass offering unto the Lord for his sin which he has sinned. And then it goes into it. So we see here the fifth offering, which is the trespass offering. Now there's going to be a long list of different types of things that qualify as trespasses. Now when you first read through this, you think the idea, well, if it's hidden from him and he doesn't know about it, and then he brought to his attention, well, then he's got to deal with it. And it gives you the impression that he did it, but he didn't mean to do it. No, no, no. That's not what's going on here. You knew what you were doing. You did it anyway. You just didn't care at that point in time. When it means it says, and it is hid from him, but now it's brought to his attention, it means now you're getting convicted about it, you know? Now you're realizing what you've done. And when you realize that, he says, if you want to make things right with God, you have to do it a little bit differently than the sin offering, okay? Now, these, this chapter is divided into three different types of sins, trespasses. One's against yourself, things you do yourself. One is against the Lord, and the other ones are against your fellow man. The ones that would be against yourself is aiding and abetting. Verse 1, he says, if you hear the voice of swearing, someone make an oath, and you're witness to whether you know, you've seen it or you just know about it. He says, if you do not utter it or inform, like let's say somebody goes back on it, and you were a party that heard about it, and you don't speak up on behalf of the person who's being wronged, he says, you shall bear your guilt. You're guilty. If you hear about it and you didn't do something about it and speak up, you're just as guilty. Or if you were to become defiled by unclean things, you know, like remember, you know, Samson, he wasn't supposed to ever touch any dead body, but what does he go and do? He's hungry and he scoops the honey out of the carcass, right? You know, I don't know if I would want to do that, but that's what he did, you know. He scoops the honey out of the, where the bees had kind of made their home in a lion's carcass, I think, and, you know, and, and he eats it, you know. He, he knew he shouldn't do that, but he did it anyway, you know. He says, if you do that, you know, you purposely did something that you knew would defile you ceremonially. He says, once you, once you get convicted about it, he says, you're guilty. You need to do something about it. Or verse four, if you swear rashly, the word there to swear means to take an oath, you know, or to pronounce a curse upon somebody. And if you do it to do evil, you know, if you speak, the word there pronounced means to speak rashly or angrily or to speak thoughtlessly. None of us ever do that, right? <laughs> He says, if you do that, you don't realize it, but then you know about it, then he's guilty of, it, of these things. So when it, you realize, I need to get right with God, that's what's wrong, I, I need to fix this, you know? He says, this is what you do. So verse six says, he shall bring a female of the flock, a lamb or a kid of the goats, for a sin offering, and the priest shall make an atonement for him concerning his sin. So similar, you'd have to come and bring this animal, the lamb or a goat in this case, you put your hand upon it, same thing as, I mean, it doesn't mention it here, but it's the same thing, it's just like a sin offering. That's why he mentions the sin offering here. It doesn't mean it's a sin offering, he's just saying do it just like the sin offering. Now verse 7 explains, if he's not able to bring a lamb, then he shall bring for his trespass, which he has committed, two turtle doves, or two young pigeons unto the Lord. One for a sin offering and one for a burnt offering. The idea is, Lord, I shouldn't have done this. I'm sorry. I want to live for you now. So the sin offering, the burnt offering, okay? So it, it's, they're a trespass offering, but they communicate both those things. And so he would bring them unto the priest. I shall offer that which is for the sin offering first. Ring off his head from his neck, but he doesn't cut it in two. And he shall sprinkle the blood of the sin offering upon the side of the altar. And the rest of the blood shall be wrung out at the bottom of the altar. It's just like a sin offering. And he shall offer the second one for a burnt offering, according to the manner that we learned in Leviticus 1. And the priest shall make an atonement for him for his sin, which he has sinned, and then he'll be forgiven. So in these sins where you've not really hurt anybody else but yourself, your own character, he says, in that case, this is how you fix it. Now, interestingly enough, he says here, but if you're not able to bring two turtle doves or two young pigeons, if you couldn't afford that, then he that sins shall bring for his offering the tenth part of an ephah of fine flour for a sin offering. That's interesting. 
No shedding of blood here. You know, this would be a grain offering. An ephah is a dry measure of quantity. And in this case, it'd be about seven gallons. So this was not to be approached lightly. It wasn't necessarily always a cheaper option. It was just more readily available. And one, third, one tenth of an ephah, therefore, you know, would be about you know, three quarts or so. So it was a lot still, but not, you know, not as much maybe as it might cost you for the turtle doves or young pigeons. And so it says here, you shall bring, put no oil upon it this time though, because remember, it's not a burnt offering. This is a trespass offering. So the Holy Spirit wasn't involved in anything you did, you know? So no oil on it. Neither shall I put frankincense thereon. This isn't about surrender. This is about making things right with God, for it is a sin offering. Then he shall bring it to the priest. And the priest shall take his handful of it, even a memorial thereof, just like the grain offering, and burn it on the altar according to the offerings made by fire unto the Lord. But this time it's more like a sin offering. And the priest shall make atonement for him as touching his sin that he has sinned in one of these things, and it'll be forgiven him. And the remnant shall be the priests as a meat offering. So the grain he could take and he could actually use it to bake something. In verse 14, we get to trespasses against God. And the Lord spoke unto Moses saying, if a soul commit a trespass and sin through ignorance in the holy things of the Lord, then he shall bring for his trespass unto the Lord a ram without blemish out of the flocks with your estimation by shekels of silver after the shekel of the sanctuary for a trespass offering. And he shall make amends for the harm that he has done in the holy thing and shall add the fifth part thereto and give it unto the priest. And the priest shall make an atonement for him with the ram of the trespass offering and it shall be forgiven him. So here, the word there for ignorance, it's not the same and it refers to actually dishonesty. So if he comes and he's gonna bring an offering to the Lord and he's dishonest, like he's concealing the fact that there's something wrong with it, but he doesn't, you know, it's not easy to find out, you know, you know, maybe it like just has the hiccups all the time. I don't know, you know, whatever it might be, if you do it deceitfully here, he says, no, 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 you're going to fix this. And you want to make it right with the Lord. You don't do that to the Lord. So you would have to come and you'd bring a new offering, a right one. And then you'd have to pay 20% extra. So you have to bring a ram without blemish and then the priest would value what the ram was worth. These guys had to be smart guys. They had to value what the ram was worth and then they would have to restore the financial loss plus 20% higher. You'd have to make amends, compensation, you know, because now the priest is stuck with something that's inferior, you know? So he would say, no, you're gonna make amends for that. Now the other area where you would have to make amends if you sinned against the Lord is if you broke any of his commandments. Verse 17, and if a soul sin and commit any of these things which are forbidden to be done by the commandments of the Lord, though he knew it not, yet is he guilty. Though he didn't know it not, again, it means though you, didn't, you weren't, didn't care about it at the time, he's still guilty and he shall bear his iniquity. So he shall bring a ram without blemish out of the flock with your estimation for a trespass offering unto the priest and the priest shall make an atonement for him concerning his ignorance wherein he erred and knew it not and it shall be forgiven him. It is a trespass offering. He has certainly trespassed against the Lord. So if you broke one of the God's commandments here, these would be the commandments about idolatry, things against the Lord, not against your fellow man. So not like theft or anything, but like idolatry or broke the Sabbath or something like that and nobody caught you. Now, when it says he didn't know about it, it just means it was not known. You got away with it. So if that's the case, he says, you still need to make it right, even though you got away with it. And you do it by bringing a ram, perfect ram, and you do the same thing as the sin offering. Chapter six. And these would be trespasses against your fellow man. And the Lord spoke unto Moses saying, if a soul sin and commit a trespass against the Lord, and here's where they are. If he lie unto his neighbor, and that which he was delivered to keep. So if you lied about something that someone left with you for safekeeping, you know, like for example, if maybe you weren't paying attention and it, it got injured or whatever, and you said, oh man, you know, robbers came in and they smacked him on the leg and that's why he's lame now, not because you weren't paying attention and he fell into a ditch, you know, and you dug him out. He says, no, if you lie about that, or he says, uh, in fellowship or in a thing taken away by violence. So in other words, if you lie concerning a deposit someone gave you for possession, someone gave you something, they shared something with you, they let you borrow it, you know, and it gets stolen or something like that, you know, he says, you know, and then you lie about it. He says, that's wrong, 
You know, if it's, if you rob from him, that's wrong. You know, you deceive him and you steal from him. Verse three, or that I've found that which was lost and lie concerning it. In other words, you find something that belongs to your neighbor and you lie about it, you know, and say, no, I just found this out in the market one day. And you swear falsely. He says, in any of all these things that a man does, sinning therein, then shall it be because he has sinned and is guilty that he shall restore, make amends again, that which he took violently away or the thing which he has deceitfully gotten or that which was delivered to him to keep or the lost thing which was found or all about which he has sworn falsely. So these five different trespasses against your fellow man. He says, he shall even restore it in the principle and then add 20%, the fifth part more thereto, and give it unto whom it appertains, to whom it belongs in the day of his trespass offering. So when you bring your offering to the Lord, you need to bring the restoration money too. So not only do you got you're out a ram, you know, because it mentions here, he shall bring his trespass offering to the Lord, a ram without blemish out of the flock. With your estimation, the idea is it had to be valued as worthy enough for, by the priest to bring it for a trespass offering, then you'd make atonement. You had to have your restoration money with you. If you walked up and said, you know, I'm gonna pay back John tomorrow, the priest said, come back tomorrow. Come back tomorrow. And you bring John with you. And then when you come, you bring your offering, I'm gonna see you make it right. Otherwise, you're not doing this today. And the idea is just when we do wrong in one of these ways by somebody, we should make it right. We should financially restore the one that we wronged you know, and here he says you get charged 20% extra as well. <laughs> and then if you do that, verse 7, the priest shall make an atonement for him before the Lord and it shall be forgiven him for anything of all that he has done in trespassing therein. So how does this point to Jesus? Well, turn to 2 Corinthians 5.19. We read in 5.21 about he was made sin for us who knew no sin. For frequently I hear this from Christians. I can see how Jesus forgives my sins, my mistakes, the things I'm not trying to do, but I just mess up because I'm still a sinner. But I can't believe Jesus will forgive the things that I know I'm not supposed to do, and I do it anyway. Well, there's good news from the New Testament. <laughs> Verse 19, chapter 5 of 2 Corinthians. It says that God was reconciling all things to himself, that is, that God was reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their what? Trespasses unto them. But he has committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Listen, Jesus didn't just die for your mistakes. He died for the things that you knew what you were doing was wrong and you did it anyway. Amen? <laughs> We can come to him even when we have been foul, even when we have crossed the line where we knew it said no trespassing and we said, I don't care, God, I'm doing this my way. And when we come to our senses and we realize how foolish that was and how hurtful that was to God and how wrong it was, we say, God, could you forgive me for this too? I knew better and I did it anyway. And the Lord would say, Jesus died for that too. Amen? He died for that too. Look at Colossians chapter two with me and then I will stop talking. Colossians 2. We read it in our scripture reading. It says very clearly here in Colossians 2.13 and you verse 13 chapter 2 of Colossians and you being dead in your sins and the incircumcision of your flesh has he quickened together with him having forgiven you what? All trespasses. That's good news, folks. <laughs> because you know what? We do slip up, we do mess up, but sometimes we know full well what we're doing and we rebel against God. And I'm so glad that when I come back to him, he doesn't look at me and go, you should know better than this, Will. You are a Christian now. When I come to him and I say, Lord, I, I really blew it this time. I knew I shouldn't have done this and I did it anyway. I defied you and I'm so sorry. I don't want to do that anymore. Will you please forgive me? And the Lord says, my son died for it. I do forgive you. It's all washed away. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that you are not just our sin offering, but our trespass offering. We thank you, Lord, that whatever we've done, we can come to you knowing that if we repent and we confess, Lord, you forgive every time. 
because Lord, you'd paid the price for everything. All of our sins, all of our trespasses, all of even the wicked thoughts of our heart, Lord, you paid the price on the cross. And for that, Lord, we say tonight, thank you. And Lord, we are grateful that we don't have to come and bring, you know, every time we mess up. Lord, we'd all be broken living in a, on the street. I'm so thankful we have to bring an offering every single time that we mess up or every single time we rebel against you. But rather, we come right to your throne of grace and we appeal to your once for all sacrifice because not only are you our sin offering and our trespass offering, but you are our high priest. And therefore, you were qualified to enter into the holy of holies in heaven, the real one, and to offer your blood, your sinless blood, without blemish on the cross, to bring it to your father. And the father says, it is enough. I will forgive them. Thank you, Jesus. We love you. In your name, amen.